We didn't travel much when I was a kid. Uh, we would do some short trips to visit family, uh, not usually more than an hour or so, uh, unless we visited my mom's extended family in Jamestown, New York. Uh, that was about a four hour drive. While I can remember only a couple of those trips in much detail, I do remember one trip that we made at night. Uh, I'm pretty sure that my dad borrowed my grandmother's car for some reason, and that put me in the front seat between my parents. Uh, I remember being able to see just over the dashboard and found myself focusing on the lines of the highway, which was not a great experience. Uh, and I remember asking that classic kid travel question, are we there yet? I remember my mom or dad answering the way parents are supposed to answer that question. Almost. It helped for a few minutes, maybe for a few miles, but I'm pretty sure that I asked that question only a couple hundred more times before I was encouraged to just sit there and keep quiet. Now, whether that describes your own childhood uh, or your experiences traveling with little kids, I think we know what that's like. Being stuck in a metal box, going down the highway for hours on end, not being able to, to get up or do anything, only getting out long enough for a rest stop visit until we finally get to the destination. And that's what gets us through it, right? The anticipation of getting to the destination. Whether it's because we're going someplace exciting or just because it means getting out of the car, almost is the right answer because of anticipation. So when we have experiences where we don't know the destination, there's no anticipation. There's only confusion, doubt, frustration, fear. That's where a lot of people are when it comes to the, to the diagnosis. That moment after days, weeks, months, maybe even years of, of discomfort and symptoms and appointments, tests, or this or that medication that doesn't do what was hoped it would do. When someone is finally able to say, this is the problem and this is the solution. It's where a lot of people find themselves when suddenly they're looking for a job and not by their own choice. When they don't know how they're going to pay the bills or whether they're going to have to move. It's where a lot of people find themselves when, when the economy or their finances take a turn for the worse. When a lifetime of saving and preparing for retirement or buying a home or even for that unforeseen health crisis is wiped out and the gold disappears. For many people, if not most of us, when we don't know the destination, day-to-day -day life can be terrifying. And that gets amplified when we start thinking in terms of a lifetime, or in terms of life and death, or in terms of eternity. I know there are quite a few thr thrill seekers out there who don't necessarily worry about knowing the destination, who just get in the car and drive. But I think most of us get at least little pangs of anxiety when we're heading into the unknown. However, when we know the destination, even if we don't know how or when we're going to get there, even when there's a, a risk or, or obstacles or even danger along the way, even when we've put up with the journey for hours, days, weeks, even 40 years, there's some satisfaction or relief or comfort in the anticipation of reaching the destination in hearing almost. Honestly, uh, are we there yet is the constant vibe of the whole book of Numbers. All throughout the book, as we have followed Israel in their journey through the wilderness for 40 years, we can see their anticipation of the promised land growing. Considering our own struggles in everyday life and looking back through the cycles of Israel's rebellion, rebuke, repentance, and restoration, we would expect the people to wonder, how long, O oh Lord? Even we're probably getting that feeling. After 15 weeks and 32 chapters in the book of Numbers, I'm sure you may be wondering, are we there yet? Almost. Now that Israel is camped across the Jordan River uh, from the Promised Land, now that they've experienced God's victory over their enemies, we can see how the anticipation was building and how God was preparing Israel for the destination uh, by giving them a reminder of where they had come from and what He had done for them. 
We read in Numbers chapter 33, verses 1 and 2. Here are the stages in the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. At the Lord's command, Moses recorded the stages in their journey. This is their journey by stages. And then through Numbers 33, verses 3 through 49, we read an accounting of the journey so far. And through that, there's a list of 40 different places across the last 40 years. And over and over again, Moses tells us that they left this place and camped at this place. Even though Moses doesn't mention all the significant events that that we've been focusing on, we get a sense that God is basically telling Israel, I know you've been traveling a long way for a long time, but you're almost there. Now we can relate, can't we? There's a certain sense with all the trouble that we have in the world around us, with all the struggles we have in our own lives, struggles with our health, our relationships, our finances, our own doubts, fears, and sin. We find ourselves wondering, how long, O Lord? Now the Sunday school answer is that, well, we need to wait on God's timing and that God's timing isn't like ours. Uh, Like Peter reminded the early church, writing in 2 Peter 3, verse 8, uh, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Have you ever had one of those thousand-year days? Now, Peter was telling the early church to anticipate eternity with God, and not merely as the end point of the journey, but also as an important part of the journey. He continued asking uh, in 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12, uh, What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Peter told the church, uh, he's telling us what God was teaching Israel, to live in anticipation, not to get bogged down or distracted by the things that, that happen in the journey, or even by the duration of the journey, but to keep focused on God and where God is leading. Now, with that long list reminding the people of every place they camped over the past 40 years, we get a sense that God wants them, even us, to remember where we came from, to remember what we've encountered along the way, the good, the bad, the struggles, the provision, the rebellion, the judgment and punishment, and the deliverance. However, as important as it is to remember, it's more important to live right now in anticipation of what is yet to come. Even though God reminded the people of where they had been, he also prepared them for where they're going and what they would do. It tells us in Numbers chapter 33, verses 50 through 56, On the plains of Moab, by the Jordan across from Jericho, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols, and demolish all their high places. Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Distribute the land by lot, according to your clans. To a larger group, give us a larger inheritance, and to a smaller group, a smaller one. Whatever falls to them by lot will be theirs. Distribute it uh, according to your ancestral tribes. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you live. And then I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Now God reminded Israel of the journey, but he wanted them to live in anticipation of their destination. God was leading them toward their inheritance, the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham when he said in Genesis 17 verse 8, The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. As God prepared Israel for the fulfillment of his promise, he was telling them that the journey was almost over. But in the meantime, they would have to continue following him in faith, 
living in anticipation in the here and now. And that's what we find in Numbers chapters 33 through 35. Here God gives Israel not only a reminder of where they came from and how they got there, but also a description of what they would have to do in preparation to receive the promised land and and to live in it. As God continues to lead and teach Israel, he's teaching us that the journey following God isn't always going to be easy. It's going to take a while, and it's going to be difficult, uh, whether because of our own doubt, fear, and sin, rebellion, or because of trouble caused by other people in our lives. Still, we need to live in anticipation, relying on God's grace and following faithfully. Now, one thing we see here is that we need to settle where we're called. I think that's an important lesson we can pull from that list of 40 places over 40 years. Uh, With every statement of, they left this place and camped at this place, We can see God teaching the people that as significant as the destination is, they still have to settle where he leads them along the way. We also need to keep this in mind. I mean, yes, we need to remember where we came from. Yes, we need to keep the destination in focus, but we also need to settle where we're called from place to place, from situation to situation. Now, I think there's a blessing to living in anticipation. Anticipation keeps us from anchoring ourselves to the past, and it keeps us heading toward what is yet to come without neglecting the here and now. It seems that we're really good at that, either hanging on to the, to the past or longing for the future in such a way that we ignore where we are, as if it's some kind of uncomfortable or unfortunate distraction. This is how we lose our way, and this is how we lose our effectiveness when we sit back remembering the glory days of our past, or when we just sit there barely hanging on until Jesus returns to take us out of this mess. Anticipation keeps us moving. Now this was important for Israel, and this accounting of their movement over the past 40 years shows us that it was important for for fulfilling God's purpose and plan. Because God desired to have a relationship with his people, It was important to remind them of who God is and what God had done to establish and maintain that relationship and also to prompt faithful people to maintain their relationship. God told Israel in Leviticus 26 verses 11 through 13, I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. And so with each move, they left this place. They camped at this place over and over again. Israel was reminded of God's presence and God's leading from place to place. Their everyday lives were lived in the anticipation of God's leading. As God led them from place to place, they settled, maybe not permanently, but with the anticipation that God would work in and among them so that they might walk with heads held high, so they might fulfill God's purpose and plan. Now, church, we also need to settle where God leads us, and not just to to settle, not just to exist or just to survive, but to dig in and to live in anticipation of what God will do in us, among us, and through us, so that we can walk with heads held high, knowing what God has already done in our past and what God promises to do in our present and future. I think this is one of the most exciting things about our faith and life in Jesus. I mean, with all the things going on in the world, uh, in our own lives, It's easy to focus on Jesus' promise and John's prayer in Revelation 22, verse 20, where it says that he who testifies to these things, Jesus, says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. But we can't be so distracted by the troubles of the world that we just settle, sit back waiting for Jesus to come and get us. We need to settle where he's called us and to live in anticipation of what is yet to come. 
We need to be encouraged by what Jesus told his disciples in John 14, verse 1. He said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus told them that that life would be a struggle, but they must trust him. More than that, Jesus told them to live in, in anticipation of what God would continue to do in them and among them and through them. Uh, He says later in John 14, verse 12, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Now talk about anticipation. Uh, To do what Jesus had done and even greater things? Now, certainly, Jesus had accomplished the greatest task. He died on the cross to forgive our sins and rose again so that we might have new life, eternal life. All throughout Jesus' life and ministry, he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, calling people to repent, to turn away from their old sinful lives, and to turn back to God. Uh, These are the things that Jesus' disciples would continue to do, uh, that we continue to do even today. While Jesus did what was necessary to provide new life, Jesus' disciples, the church that would follow us today, we continue to preach and teach the good news. And thousands, even millions, have heard the good news and believed it and responded to it in faithful repentance. While Jesus spent his whole life in ministry in and around the region of the, of the promised land, His followers took the good news and began making disciples of Jesus around the whole world by the power of God within them and among them, as he told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just as God had called Israel to himself, uh, to the promised land, leading them to settle where he called them and to accomplish his purpose and plan within them and among them and through them. So Jesus calls us to himself to do as he had done and even more. Now, are we there yet? Almost. But in the meantime, we need to settle where he calls us and live in anticipation of what God is doing in us and among us and through us. And as we settle where God calls us, we need to stay within the boundaries. I think we find this in the next chapter, uh, where in Numbers 34, verses 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites and say to them, When you enter Canaan, the land that will be allotted to you as an inheritance is to have these boundaries. And then it goes on in in verses 3 through 12, where God defined the borders of the promised land. Uh, Basically, it extended to just south of the Dead Sea, uh, west to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, uh, to just north of the Sea of Galilee, and then to the east along the Jordan River. Uh, Then in Numbers 34, verses 13 through 29, God assigned specific leaders of the tribes to work with uh, Eleazar the priest and Joshua, the new leader of the people, to assign the people's inheritance within those borders. Now, Here at the end of 40 years in the wilderness, God not only established both the boundaries and the plan for distributing the land where the people would settle, as he called them, he gave them instructions. With those instructions, the people were again living in anticipation of what God would do for them, among them, and through them to accomplish his purpose and plan. The settlement of the promised land wasn't going to be a free-for-all, like we could look at American history, the late 1800s, the land rushes. Uh, This was going to be a distributed and and, and a sign by God as an inheritance. It tells us in Numbers 34, verses 13 and 14, that Moses commanded the Israelites, assign this land by lot as an inheritance. The Lord has ordered that it be given to the nine and a half tribes, because the families of the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance. The distribution of the land wasn't merely geographical. It was relational. If Israel wanted to live with God, they had to stay in the boundaries of the promised land. They had to stay within the boundaries of the promises of God. 
I think that's why God calls attention again to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Uh, Last week, we saw how these tribes were tempted into complacency and doubt. Instead of living in in anticipation of what God was doing and settling where God called them, these tribes wanted to live where they were, outside the promised land. And they found themselves outside of God's promises. Uh, We read last week, again, 1 Chronicles 5, verse 25, they were unfaithful to the God of their ancestors and prostituted themselves to the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. And then it goes on to tell us they were the first uh, to be defeated, uh, to be dragged into exile uh, by Assyria. God established Israel's boundaries to remind them that he had established Israel to fulfill his purpose and plans, not their own. Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they chose their own inheritance for their own purposes. They lived outside God's boundaries, uh, not just geographically, but spiritually. And their defeat and destruction was a result of, of their rebellion and insistence to live outside of God's boundaries. Now, as we live in, t- in anticipation, settling where God calls us, we also need to stay within the boundaries. That is, we need to stay within God's boundaries, within God's inheritance, within God's grace. Certainly, that means we need to live our lives in obedience to God's word. Uh, Jesus told his disciples later in in John 14, uh, verses 15 through 17, he says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you. And will be in. Jesus tells us when we stay within the boundaries, we live with God and God lives with us. Better still, God lives within us. Even though God expressed his desire to live among Israel, to be their God and for them to be his people, here Jesus promised that God, the Holy Spirit, would not only live with us, but within us. God fulfills that promise when we put our faith in Jesus, which Peter told the crowds who responded to the first gospel sermon of the church in Acts 2.38, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God fulfills the promise within each of us and among all of us who put our faith in Jesus. Paul told the early church this in Ephesians 2, verse 22. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Now, what does that mean for us? When we put our faith in Christ, God the Holy Spirit lives within us and builds us up as individuals and as the church. And he's building us up to be his people so that we might fulfill his purpose and plan in us and among us, and through us. As we stay within the boundaries God has given us, God lives with us, within us. And as God lives within us, he enables us to do what he has called us to do. And in this way, uh, when we live in anticipation, we can serve God for life. We can see this illustrated in the lives of the Levites as God describes their allocation of land. It says in Numbers 35, verses 2 and 3, Command the Israelites to give the Levites towns to live in from the inheritance the Israelites will possess, and give them pasture lands around the towns. Then they will have towns to live in and pasture lands for the cattle they own and all their other animals. And then it goes on, where God specifies the the number of towns and how those towns were to be allocated, saying in Numbers 35, verses 7 and 8, In all, you must give the Levites 48 towns, together with their pasture lands. The towns you give the Levites from, from the land the Israelites possess are to be given in proportion to the inheritance of each tribe. Take many towns from a tribe that has many, but few from one that has few. Now remember that the Levites didn't receive a specific portion of the land as their tribal inheritance. 
while the allocation of land for the rest of Israel was meant to be their inheritance from God, the Levites were called apart to be holy, to be separate, to illustrate actually that, that all of God's people are God's inheritance and, and that God himself is our inheritance. The Levites were set apart to serve God, to, to guard the boundaries for Israel before God. Because they were distributed among the tribes uh, throughout the land, God demonstrated how he intentionally worked to maintain his presence and guidance among the people. More importantly, God distributed the Levites among the people so that all of Israel might continue to experience God's grace. This was the purpose uh, of the cities of refuge. Uh, God said in Numbers chapter 35, verse 6, that six of the towns you give the Levites will be cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone may flee. These six cities of refuge were set apart by God among the Levites so that those who were accused of murder might receive a fair trial and be saved from death. Three of the cities were in the promised land, and three were in the land to the east of the Jordan, and all six of those cities were distributed uh, from north to south in both of those regions, so that there, were easy, there was easy access uh, to them from, from anywhere by anyone who needed them. In Numbers 35, verses 16 through 32, God gave specific instructions for determining whether the, the killing was intentional or unintentional, and what must be done in response to the killing either way. Certainly, this was a matter of life and death for the accused. And in providing the cities of refuge, God enabled the people to live in anticipation of both God's righteous justice and His grace. By establishing the cities of refuge among the Levites, God enabled the Levites to, to continue to serve as boundaries between holy God and sinful people. While the Levites' cities were, were meant to endure through the generations, uh, enabling the Levites to serve God for life from generation to generation, the cities of refuge also enabled the Levites to serve God for the sake of life. God distributed the Levites among the people so that the people might be encouraged to serve God for life, again, from generation to generation. But God established the cities of refuge so that even those who take life might have their lives spared by God's grace. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, uh, the people were living in anticipation of new life with God. They knew that what was coming wasn't going to be easy, that they were going to have to fight to receive what God was giving them, that they were likely going to keep on screwing up their relationship with God, with their fear, their doubts, uh, their outright rebellion. But with this promise of God's grace, new life, even for those who took life, they could live in anticipation of serving God for life. While the Levites were set apart to serve God for life, guarding the boundary between holy God and sinful people, God had established the means by which even those who faced death could receive new life. What's more important is that the cities of refuge were not just for the Israelites. It says in Numbers 35 verse 15, these six towns will be a place of refuge for Israelites and for foreigners residing among them so that anyone who has killed another accidentally can flee there. The cities of refuge were, were good news for everyone who faced death, and it was the Levites' job to extend God's grace to everyone who came looking forward. Church, just as the Levites were led to settle where God called them and set apart to serve God for life, so are we called to serve God for life that is, throughout our lives, and for the sake of new life for everyone who needs it. Peter told the early church, uh, writing in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 12, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. 
live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Church, just because, uh, or because we have put our faith in Jesus, because God the Holy Spirit lives within us and among us, we must settle where God calls us. Uh, we, we must stay within the boundaries that God has established for us in his word. And we must serve God for life, living our lives in such a way that, that those who need God's grace might find it among us. This is our mission, to preach and teach the good news of God's mercy that he provided through Jesus' death, and the new life that God provides through Jesus' resurrection. Because of what God has done through Jesus' death and resurrection and through our faith in him, we can live in anticipation of what is yet to come, no matter where God calls us. As we live in anticipation, the world will see how our lives are different, which will give us the opportunities to share the good news of new life that we've found in Jesus. And so church, we've got to settle where God calls us. We, we need to stay within the boundaries and we need to serve God for life. But if you have not yet responded to the good news about receiving new life by God's grace through faith in Jesus, I encourage you to do that right away. And you can receive that new life when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life. When you repent, turning away from your old sin, life of sin and turning back to, to God to receive new life when you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and when you join with Jesus in your own spiritual death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, when you do that, you'll be saved. Now, you'll be forgiven of your sins, and God the Holy Spirit will come and live within you, helping you to live this new life in anticipation of what is yet to come, settling wherever God calls you and staying within the boundaries of God's word and serving God for life alongside the rest of, of your new family, the church, as God builds us all up together to, to help others find new life in Jesus. Now, if you're ready to make that decision or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we might get together and work through those questions as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, as I, as I read the scriptures and see what you have done uh, within and among and through your faithful people, uh, Lord, as I consider how you've already transformed my life by your Holy Spirit living in me, right now I pray that you will continue to help me, to help us live life in anticipation of, of what you will continue to do in our lives and in the lives of others. And right now I pray for those who have not yet put their faith in you. God, guide them to yourself by your Holy Spirit and through your word and with the help of your people, the church, so that they might believe the good news and turn to you in faith so that they might find new life in Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.